Hello, everybody. Hi. My name is Liz Foster Shainer. Uh, we are here for a panel on the role of theater directors in times of crisis. We are in the third full day of a 10 day National Institute for Directing on Ensemble Creation. Um, this institute is a true collaboration between Art to Action and Pangea World Theater. Uh, it began in 2012 with a pilot um, really focused on bringing in directors of color and women to share practices, to um, share their stories, their backgrounds, their histories, their people, their places, uh, in a way that is not transactional like so many of these spaces can be, um, but that allows people to show up as themselves and be authentic and to really learn and grow from and with each other. Um, the Institute is funded by the Mellon Foundation and Doris Duke Foundations. Um, for this panel today, I am joined by some amazing artists, Ismael Khalidi, Stephanie McKee Anderson, Alexandra Mehta, and Dipankar Mukherjee. And I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment. I will not share their bios. They are very impressive, and I really encourage you to read them on your own time. Um, but I wanna start by thinking about what is this crisis that we're talking about? When you Google theater and crisis, you get the top hits are really about American theater and how American theater is in a state of crisis, um, crisis as a turning point. Um, and when, when I read these articles, I see that the crisis that they're talking about, and Stephanie uh, mentioned this earlier, they're talking about um, buildings and institutions that are failing, that are facing real economic hardships. And behind that is real people right? Um, but, but it's really about how, are the, how is the institution of American theater in crisis? And we're going to shift that today to really think about what are the crises that we are facing as a humanity? Because we have been in crisis for a very long time. Um, and the artists who are on this panel, the directors who are on this panel, face those crises directly with their work. Um, so we're, sh we're shifting that frame a little bit. So as, we, as you introduce yourselves, um, I ask you to introduce yourselves, your bio, your history around theater and directing, but really think back to the moments of crisis that you have faced or are facing and how those have shaped you as a director, as an artist, as an ensemble member, as a human being. And that will help us launch this conversation. Thank you, Liz. Um, and thank you to everybody here everybody online and to the amazing artists that I'm, I'm sitting next to on this panel. Um, <clears throat> I'm really honored to be here. <sighs> you know, well, my name is Ismail Khalidi. I'm a, I'm a playwright and a director. I'm a directing fellow here at Pangea World Theater as well. Um, and I'm Palestinian American, born in Beirut, raised in Chicago. Um, and uh, my work tends to uh, tackle uh, colonialism in the Middle East, war, imperialism, racism, white supremacy, settler colonialism. Um, and so that's often uh, what my work, my work tackles. Um, you know, I, I think where I want to start with that question, because it's a big question, um, and I know my colleagues uh, will have a lot to add, but is kind of naming our, our crises, right? Like the overlapping crises that we're we're in and facing. And of course, to start with the fact that for indigenous folks on this continent in the Americas, uh, you know, we're in year 500, whatever, of a crisis, of an ongoing crisis, which has been consistently, systematically resisted at every step of the way, including right here in Minnesota by the Ojibwe and Dakota people. So I think it's important to, to shout that out. Um, Right now as a Palestinian, obviously the crisis which is enveloping my heart and my being and my work is the fact that we are in an ongoing mass slaughter event in Gaza, um, a genocide. Uh, and, and one that is being carried out with our tax dollars here in the United States with advanced weaponry that is being sold as we speak and tested as we speak on human beings. Um, 50,000 of them, I would say at least by this point, eight months in. Um, 
And I think it's just important to, to call that out, to name that for what it is. And also to kind of, for me, to understand that, um, you know, those things, those weapons are being tested in a kind of a dress rehearsal for what is coming, not only to the global South, but to all of us. And so for me, it's incredibly important to just name that. And I think one of the crises we face is the incapacity to name that or the propensity of folks in power to um, censor that. Um, and so I wanted to name that, but also like what are the other crises that are for me, not only overlapping, but in intimately intertwined and connected. Um, we're in a carceral crisis in this country. We have a healthcare crisis in this country. We have a reproductive health crisis in this country. We have um, a, a crisis of, uh, of violence against women, of missing indigenous women, queer LGBTQ folks. Um, you know, we're in a climate catastrophe. And, and, and just to bring it back, like those weapons being tested and those limits being pushed in Gaza with a captive population of 2 million human beings, I would say one of the prime targets is going to continue to be refugees and migrants uh, and displaced people from this climate catastrophe, primarily from the global south and from poor uh, from poor areas. Um, we're in a crisis of democracy. We do not live in a democracy in this country. Uh, and I think that if we don't name that, then, we, then the word crisis means nothing, <clears throat> right? We're in a crisis of fascism. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, we're in a cr crisis of language and journalism. Like, I mean, if you read the New York Times, the amount of violence um, and gaslighting and just a distortion of language and truth is astounding. And it's not a surprise to, I think, a lot of people listening or, or in this room, but um, a lot of those same institutions that, big institutions that talk about being in crisis are the same people that read the New York Times um, as their most trusted source of news. So I think for me, unless we're, we're, we're talking about the same things, um, and understanding the degree to which those crises are, are, are related. They feed each other, they're laid on top of each other. Um, you know, and there's an ongoing genocide in Sudan, in the Congo. Uh, there is an uprising against settler colonialism in Kanaki, in quote unquote, French Polynesia, right? So, I mean, we have these kind of 19th century crises in the 21st century. Um, yeah, so for me, that's a really important thing to, to name. And, you know, I think we'll have more chance to talk about it, our own work and, and, um, and how crises affect the work of, of all of us on this panel. So, yeah. I appreciate you naming the crisis of humanity, which is a space um, that I feel like we're in right now um, we've been slowly getting to that space where it's just in your face. I think for people like us, um, we felt that very deeply. This is just the first time we're seeing folks who kind of don't care about saying it outwardly. Um, so my name's Stephanie McKee Anderson. Um, I'm a daughter of Mississippi. My birth home is Picayune, Mississippi. I am raised between Mississippi and New Orleans. So I feel like if I'm a daughter of Mississippi, I'm a goddaughter of New Orleans. Um, and that's where my work is. For the past almost 15 years, I have uh, been in the position of being executive artistic director of Junebug Productions in New Orleans, which was founded by John O'Neill, the late John O'Neill. Um, and who has a longer history, um, we're considered the organizational successor to the Free Southern Theater, which was founded in 1963 by John O'Neill, Gilbert Moses, and um, 
and Doris Derby. Um, I'm always very proud to say her name. I got a chance to know her uh, before she passed away. Um, and that kind of anchors a little bit of, of, of the why I have the lens that I do um, on what it means to work in crisis. So I think for the last 15 years, almost 15 years, that um, my focus has been on what it means to be a black woman in leadership inside of an organization, inside of an organization that is situated in the South, inside of an organization situated in the South founded by a black man, inside of an organization in the South founded by a black man and inside of a city that is decidedly black. tells us a lot. Inside of a city that's decidedly black but has the highest incarceration rate in the world. All of these things help to frame the work that we do. And inside of a city, <laughs> yes, I can keep going with that. <laughs> highest incarceration rate in the world and below sea level below sea level. Katrina at one time, one of the, the, the biggest natural, natural disasters at the time. And we also saw fingers pointed at us about all the things that we didn't do and how much more prepared we should have been. And we're going, it's just a matter of time before it happens in another city. It's coming to a city near you. And, and we've certainly seen that. All of these things if I lay it out for you, you understand that we work under a state of crisis all the time. Even the act of gathering, if we decide we wanna gather as a community outside, there's great care, thought around what planning something like that would be for a group of people that look like us to gather anywhere, that as an act is planning under crisis. Doing work inside of a city that's under constant threat of hurricanes or tornadoes now, right? Is planning under threat of disaster. None of that means anything without the people that it affects, right? Um, I'm now 56 years old. Two years ago, I lost my mother. My father is 80 years old. So yet another crisis is how it is that we care for our elders during that time, right? Knowing that for a lot of our communities or communities that I'm familiar with, we do not put our parents inside of a home that they have done the great work to raise us and that we then are like, it is time for us to then take care of you. That's our responsibility. But there's a crisis even in care in that little bit of time. Never thought that I would have to be an advocate, a medical advocate, a medical advocate for myself. So the idea of theater under crisis is, is, is provocative. Just the word crisis is provocative and something that for us to unpack. And I guess the last thing I wanna say, um, the reason why it kind of sat with me for a while, and like, are the people that are asking and consistently asking this question of what it means to work under crisis, is it that they really wanna know what it is? Because we've talked about it so much or is it that this is a group of people who keep asking the question because they're not practitioners of community care or community organizing? And so it's a foreign concept to them. Therefore, they're constantly looking for a how-to guide and there is none. Other than you stay anchored in who it is and what it is that you believe and what's most important, which is the people that do the work. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, 
Hi, my name is Alex Mehta, she, hers. Um, and I'm an uh, ensemble member and co-artistic director of a place called Studio Luna, formerly known as Teatro Luna West and formerly known as Teatro Luna. We've had a couple of rebirths in our 25-year history. Um, thank you so much for naming all those crises, and we could name so many more. I think the ones I'm thinking about in this moment, and maybe they sound a little self-serving or small, but they're what, what are living with me, and that is the, this um, unprocessed grief crisis that I think we're living in, um, some groups longer than others. Um, and on my worst day, when I think through a white lens, I'm like, what am I doing with theater? But then I understand my role in theater is using these tools to help people return to their body, reconnect their mind and their body to maybe process some of that grief. Um, and then in terms of like the theatrical ecology field, I don't know the word I'm looking for. I don't care about their crisis. I think they made their own crisis. They're remain, choosing to remain in their crisis. For me, their crisis is really simple. It's a crisis of priority. And until the priorities change, I, I don't care, you know? Um, and just to give a clear example for anybody who's like, what priorities are you talking about? Probably not in this room. Um, is when they, and we talked about this a little bit at lunch, the places that chose to, and they have historically, I guess, we can look through their budget and how they spend money to understand their, their moral compass. But when we chose to save buildings over people, I don't care about you anymore. Um, we're tiny, our budget is tiny, but um, we luckily had a, a very small part of our NIFA grant at the time when 2020, like, like the height of the crisis really hit. And it was no question for us. The show's going down, we're paying the artist. If we lose our space, a well, um, and any other money we had in that bank account spent, spent without like a thought. Um, and if it meant the closing of a 24, 23 year old organization, so what? What we are is not our bank account. What we are is a set of values. What we are is a set of practices. What we are is a group of people who have committed to each other. So when I'm asked what is the role of a theater director in a time of crisis, it is to find, to be able to like hold your people together, to ask what they need and respond. Um, we're very much centered in where we are. So right now we're in Boyle Heights, a neighborhood that's under a crisis of gentrification, under a crisis of police brutality, um, so many things. And so we have not been ready to come back as a theater in terms of performing, we can't afford what we wanna pay people in this moment to make work. So instead, we are doing a lot more digital work, we're doing audiobooks, but our space, we're not willing to give it up because we have belief that there'll be use for it in the future. So what we can use it for now is completely giving it away free to our community organizations, those supporting people um, who are undocumented, unhoused, right? Like these are the things that we can do and I don't feel any less of a theater Right? In fact, I feel probably more in the like actual meaning of what it is to bring people together doing that. So, man, I'm losing my way because I'm getting so excited. Um, <laughs> but I think, Stephanie, the other thing that's on my heart is you asked us in a workshop earlier, who are your people? And I did just want to bring them into the room. I want to say that I'm in the lineage, the artistic lineage of Diane Rodriguez. I bring with me some people um, that are, I, I, and I said, healers, disruptors, and deep divers, and I just want to name them Lauren Turner-Hines, Clotilde Horn, Maya Milan-Gonzalez, Miranda Gonzalez, um, Severin Blake, and Rad Pereira. I just, I am so inspired by watching people find solutions, resources, and holding space for their communities, and those women and people are doing it in fantastic ways, and the last thing I'll say on that is there is no how-to, like you said, we all have to build our map and there's something we can learn from each other's maps, but we have to build our own map. And I think that's what I'm learning. I cannot just take other people's routes and think they'll work for me in a time of crisis, especially. Yeah, to Ponker. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Alex. Be beautiful words when we smile, Stephanie. Um, I love Liz's nuanced thinking. Um, so that's a very powerful question. 
um you know when you have always uh, when the only waters in which you swim is called crisis you know <laughs> is it a crisis yeah. uh you know i i a crisis to me is um, a point of no return uh crisis is when imagination fails me you know my mother would always say that a bengali <clears throat> uh, mother we generally a, a regular lunch would be rice uh, then lentil dal uh, then sub sabji something green uh and if you can afford it on a sunday we might have fish <laughs> uh, and so then depending on the economic class uh, a, a mother who does not have a middle class low middle class mother does not have money to make fish will make just rice and dal if a mother does not have money to buy dal but lentil will just make rice if the mother who does not have money to make greens and lentil will take the rice and you know the liquid uh, in which you make the rice is is called thana uh, i don't know the english word you know the starchy water um you know that is the soup you know and if the soup is has to be given away but to someone who's less uh, who has le- less fortunate you know uh, then you have rice with salt uh, you see the so to me crisis is a point of no return when americans talk about crisis sitting in air conditioned rooms uh, 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 you know before food or after lunch uh you know i'm not undermining pain you know it's not a competition uh you know crisis is a relative word uh and and to me to me um uh, uh, if if my imagination is lobotomized that's my crisis you know because no human born can stop me from imagining a way out you know and i believe that god is always on my side i only stop believing it when i used to consistently fail in my math class no <laughs> there were you yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i did not know a single answer but you still didn't write it down for me um so to me you know crisis i'm very conscious uh, we call ourselves pangea world theater for a reason because it's a lack of solidarity to me is a crisis you know because no uh hegemonic power is that powerful if we uh i mean uh, by we i don't mean us individually but all our communities who are not in the center can join together truly truly join together over a period of time not come together only when a black brother's face is you know crushed on asphalt down the street here you know no, uh, you know and not when uh, gaza is being bombed left right and center you know without the and the world watches it you know to be if we truly if we truly come together there isn't a hegemonic centrality of power that can defeat our imagination if we truly that's my search and so you know to be particularizing because you know all our legacy the legacy the legacy of weaving you know we we are born into the leg- three legacies three realities you know framework one is genocide against the indigenous two is you know slavery you know the heinous act of slavery and then th- third is the stealing and torturing of colonization so genocide slavery and colonization those i mean one is the swimming the one is the container another is the water and and the third is you know people watching on, on you know from the bank watching us sink you know so if you are born into that water then crisis is life you know so it's not crisis it's life you know one a poet in india says sangharsh hi jeevan hai which means life is struggle struggle is life what's so unbelievably extraordinary about that you know so so therefore therefore the nomenclature the because there is no crisis in many of my friends who are their directors too 
<laughs> they, they are still doing guys and dolls and, uh, you know, South Pacific and, uh, you know, uh, there is no crisis. There is no crisis to them. So crisis is very particularized and personalized. And, and to me, um, to me, I, I'm, yet to, I, I'm yet to know what is the crisis in my life. I think the day my imagination is stolen, that'll be my crisis. Because workings of government, workings of people of power, the reality of who has money and who does not, you know, those things we know, there's no surprise. There's not a crisis. I mean, you're just revealing yourself, you know. But the point is, you can remain there, but what we create around it, right? The day we stop creating around it, that's the crisis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Ismail, for grounding us in the very real crises that we are facing at this moment and the impending crises and the ticking time bomb of the crises that are occurring right now. And thank you, Stephanie and Alex and Dipankar for really helping shift to this, this idea of what it is to be in crisis and to think of it as a limit of our imaginations. And I think when we, when we look at the pandemic and we see how different institutions responded, it is about priorities, as you were saying, Stephanie, and the inability to imagine what it would be like to shift those priorities. And I, I appreciate that we don't, that there is no how to, but for those with limited imaginations, can you share some examples of how the crisis that you, a crisis that you might have been facing really shifted tangibly your practices and the way that you work with your communities and the way that you think of creating theater. And maybe Stephanie, if you could start, you gave us that brilliant example of um, even just from a very human resources perspective, how you allocate your budget to keep your people safe Mm -hmm. um, in times of crisis. Sure, sure. Um, so over lunch, we were just having a conversation about, you know, what it means to be in crisis. And I said, oh, well, we've been in crisis several times. Um, which one are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> There's the one that we're con in, under constant threat of, and I mentioned that earlier because we, um, in New Orleans, where Junebug is housed, um, is below sea level. And, um, and for a very long time, we've seen an uptick in um, the frequency of storms and uh, the strength of storms that have been coming through. Um, and as a result, we've had flooding has happened more often than not. Um, we've gotten hit by hurricanes a couple of times. Um, and so one of the things we learned from Katrina, so this is to go back to what it is that we learn. Um, for some people, I think outside, there were lot, lots of shame and blame that came on folks uh, during Katrina over, well, why didn't they? And I gave the example of my husband. My husband and his family um, did not leave. They got stuck there and had to um, be rescued from a house across the street. They were stuck for four days. And um, it wasn't because they didn't have the money. It wasn't because they didn't have adequate transportation. Um, it wasn't because they didn't think about leaving. It was because one of them, um, my sister-in-law, had to go and work. But she had to work because they told them, because of another storm threat, when she took off, said, if you don't come in, you could lose your job. And so what does that mean? Your family's not going to leave without you. So they all stayed. If one stays, we all stay. And that's the, the thing that happened there. But with our staff, sometimes it's just a matter of the resources to leave. Because sometimes you got to go, you got to check into a hotel. The hotel could be $200 a night. Who knows how long you're going to have to be there. Where are you going to get that money from? And so the thing that we put in place at Junebug as a line item is an emergency fund that's there specifically for the staff to be able to, um, if they have to leave, they have money that can be utilized specifically for them to be in a hotel somewhere. And we already um, have laid things out so that people can work remotely. That's a small thing that can be done, but it's big 
when it comes to whether or not you have the resources. Let's not let that be a reason for you not evacuating, caring for yourself or your families. Money should not be an issue for that. Anyone else like to respond? Yeah, you know, I um, thank you for that example, Stephanie. You know, one thing that that comes to mind too is 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 a lot of this to me is encapsulated in this in in kind of organized abandonment. Like it's a crisis of organized abandonment and ex and making human beings expendable. Like that's what all of those things that you named, Deepankar, and we've named colonialism, slavery, white supremacy, they make people expendable, right? Like that is what's behind, that's the engine of it. And, and that idea of organized abandonment. And so for me, our role as artists and as theaters is the opposite of abandonment, which is like these examples of radical love. And that can take, and we've talked a lot about this in, in the Institute over these past days. And it's at the core of what the Institute and all of these beautiful artists practice, which is radical love. Um, and that might take the form of, you know, keeping folks on staff through crises, speaking up to other institutions of power, um, standing in solidarity, standing against censorship, producing folks that are being censored, right? It can take so many forms, opening up your space, um, in times of crisis. And I think everybody here who works in the field does that, practices that. Um, and it, it's as small as holding the space as a director in the room. It's holding people's time commitments, holding their family commitments in the room, whether it you know, interferes with the production or not, you know, um, and making space for that. And so to me, it, it kind of works up and down up and down the scale. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that and then I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Alex or Deepankar. Um, I'll just add something really small. I, I'm in the small scale right now, I don't know. Small is all, right? Um, so something that we, we've always had a practice of um, warm-ups and check-ins and some body work. But starting in 2020, we moved from 30 minutes to sometimes 90 minutes and paying for that additional time for our artists when they come to the space. Because even if they at first are like, I don't know that I have the time when they do go through the process of working with our choreographers to return to their body, to spend time in their body, it is a, a form of healing. And we all, specifically, I'll just think about women of color, um, we're the first to say, I don't need that. Somebody else will need that time. You all could use those $25 an hour, those $45 an hour on something else. And it's like, no, your body deserves it. So in, in all the little ways we contend, we always tried to have food at any event we were doing, but we upped the levels of food that we were bringing to any rehearsal or event because our community was increasingly having a problem going to the grocery store and buying as much as they could. So what are the small ways in which we could be responsive to anything that was happening, I think is something we're continuing to, to deepen and to think about. Um, and I know it sounds small, but it, the impact is not so small. And then I think the last thing I'll say is there's like all of these increasing um, data points about the increased risk of, um, like a suicide. I was trying to think of like a better word for it. Um, among specifically black and Latine and indigenous women of color, young women of color age 14 through, through 21, um, since 2021 specifically. And although we're not equipped to like fully respond to that problem, the way we think about it is as we serve um, a full range of women, specifically aging women, and we always have in our organization, these are the people that never had the like, so, which I think is a crisis in our, of our own of like how we treat the aging population. Um, but my point is, uh, these are folks who never had access to some of the programs that exist today. And the way that trauma, that abuse, that like all of that lives in that body, um, we think it's like, how do we support that um, transformation in relation to self? Yeah.
There's nothing small about anything that you do, Alex. <laughs> There's no small effort. Uh, integrity does not have uh, a size, you know. So I've admired your work and who you are and what you and your articulation. Um, your impact is huge. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is the question? I... Specific. Uh, specific examples. Okay. Imaginations. Share some of the ways that you are responding yeah. to. Questions. Imagination is a plenty. <laughs> uh, uh, I can, I'll, I'll share with you uh, what what we did. Um, uh, we are on Lake Street, uh, the police precinct, which dispatched. Uh, uh, I'm talking about Brother Floyd's mother. Uh, the police precinct that dispatched uh, the cops uh, are, is on Lake Street, a, a few blocks from our house, um, and uh, and and so and and then these uh, white supremacists that, that came from different towns uh, and they set fire to our whole uh, community. Um, you know, buildings got burnt where where we had our previous uh, national directing institute. You won't even know that that whole building is gone. Uh, the restaurant where we ha went and had dinner, Gandhi Mahal, is gone. So, so that's uh, you know that that is what the water was. That is what happened, you know. And the point is, therefore, uh, the cri the crisis for two years we did not uh, we Panji had no source of income, and we had a staff of twelve, you know. And and uh, like what uh, Ismail you referred to Stephanie's comment that one thing. Nobody is dispensable, you know. So it was amazing. Uh, we had, uh, uh, if we can call them journalists, nowadays I stopped calling uh, them journalists. You know, anybody who has a Microsoft Word is not a journalist. You, know, you need to have fearless spirit of, uh, uh, you know, telling the truth. That's when you have the, or, or you should have the audacity, you know, to tell the truth. Uh, though don't call yourself a journalist. Um, you know, you're a, you know, Propagandist. Uh, so, uh, you know, these multi-million dollar organizations in town, uh, you know, museums and the large regional theater and you know, uh, uh, multiple uh, ballet and, uh, you know, operas and, you know, they, they let go of 98% of their, of their staff. And they got a big article in the newspaper of fiscal integrity and fiscal responsibility. That's fiscal responsibility to let go of 98% of your staff in a moment of crisis? Where are they going to get money to eat, send their children, pay their mortgage? And how, how is it, uh, you know, fiscal integrity? In whose eyes? So that's what I meant. I don't mean to undermine the word crisis. I know the importance of the word crisis. But is crisis to whom? You know, if 98% of people are dispensable, you never needed them. And if you have employed them, that means you don't consider them any human beings except workforce. That's why it's easy for you to get rid of them. So we had, to, we had two years of no income. We kept, we, we didn't do anything great. We told our staff that we have started together and we'll close together. You know, there is nobody needs to be nervous about losing a job here, you know. And by God's grace and a lot of 25 years of hard work, just before that we got Cultural Treasures Award. Uh, and so we suddenly, <laughs> with that money, you know, we survived uh, uh, for two years. And that's the, and we also democratized our, our, our curating. You know, we um, uh, sort of made, uh, we gave, uh, resourced some money to all our staff because, because we wanted to get money out to the hands of artists of color. There was no, no income. There was no income. And our, our, our community was literally burning. Literally. And all the uh, you know, fire trucks with all their huge ass uniforms, uh, you know, costumes, they were standing. I said, can't you put the fire out? And they said, we don't go somewhere before without the police. And the police, and because of what we did to the, against the police, you know, and the pol there was no police to be found. So the fire trucks saw our buildings burn. They saw it. They didn't do anything to it. And they had a row of red trucks. Because it was cri our crisis, community of people's crisis. Right? Do, would they do that if it was happening to MIA or the Guthrie or the Walker 
or the opera. So, so that's why crisis is very particularized, you know. And so what, what we did was, first what we did was, uh, first of all, we saw that all our staff uh, members, you know, they are, uh, they are taken care of. And then money channeled through them to five people whom Adeline knows, five people who Suzanne knows, five people whom Molly knows. We, we don't know them. So get democratized our, um, you know, for our uh, the curating. So everybody was curating. Uh, and then we created right in front. Healing was necessary for our, you know, post-COVID. We came out of COVID, then Brother Floyd. Like, there was this, there, were, there was, it was just too heavy a stone. So the community needed healing. You know, so we expanded and, and, and community not in an ethereal, uh, <laughs> uh, unrealistic way. Our community was our business that could not open. All the immigrant businesses on Lake Street, none of them owned their buildings. You know, they were, majority of them are from Morelos. You know, they were all tenants. The buildings were burned, even if the city was giving them money, the, the, the landlords will not take the money because they were waiting for the biggest bidder highest insurance. And these people needed to get their businesses going to feed their family, you know. So, so then we, as a, and therefore the word community got expanded. It did not remain only theater and artists and progressives, you know. It became the business over here, the neighborhood notes, the, the, and art was just a way to stitch. Uh, you know, and so we commissioned uh, our first thing that we did. I remember the first thing we came out of COVID, we did Sharon Day's play, uh, you know, which, which needed, the community needed that healing. And then we commissioned uh, uh, Angela Two Stars, who's a Dakota artist, and who created this beautiful visual art piece right opposite the police precinct. You know, we honored a Dakota artist to create a visual artist. And the community just came from all around. You know, she created this huge piece uh, uh, um, called Transformation. And everybody, people on wheelchair, people uh, would, would come sometimes in the evening, would gather in the morning. In the afternoon, somebody came and was sitting on a bench and wrote, wrote a poem and delivered it, you know. So, so then the, the, the word, you know, community got expanded. And, and that's how we met the crisis of COVID first, and then the whole burning of our community, literal burning of our community um, uh, during uh, post Brother Floyd's murder, you know, through art. And, we, and, and another organization that came out was Longfellow Rising, uh, which uh, brought in all these intersections. You know, of business, uh, we we could not just remain in the world of art, only, uh, in, or, or rather, the right thing to say, the world of art got expanded to include everyone. Thank you. I um, have I've been carrying this uh, Grace Lee Boggs quote, a social activist and philosopher, and she said, "Creativity is the key to unlock human liberation." And I see that in the ways that you have shifted your practices and adjusted to the moments at hand and to make art more expansive. And I'm wondering, so much of what y'all y'all are talking about is it's, it's beyond theater, right? It's really about community organizing, about being present and being and showing up for your people. Is theater the word for you, for your practice? Um, is, is there another word or another way of framing the work that you do, especially in these times of crisis? Or, or if we're always in crisis, the work that you do? It's so funny because we use words interchangeably um, and it's about context. Um, on the one hand, of course, I think that what we do is we make beautiful art that is meaningful to people, that means something, that allows them um, a, a, a pathway in and is a reflection of things, of themselves, of their communities, of their work. I think when we are successful, that's what it does. Um, I think also we're, we're connectors 
to organizations that are really doing organizing work, right? So we aim to connect people to the folks that are doing that organizing work um, so that they continue to build, so that there's an arc of what our gift is of bringing people into the space and creating content that's very meaningful and powerful that creates, um, uh, that can start a conversation uh, but it is then finished with organizations that are that are that are organizing. So now there's something that's put into action. Um, I think when we do it well, that's what happens. Um, but it's funny. I think a lot of the organizations that are struggling right now would um, say uh, would apply um, something like a community theater. Which we know when people we know when people say community theater that that is code for less than that that means not as rigorous as right and so I I know that the work that we do has great rigor. Yes. I'm relishing this moment right now because it shows the lack of rigor inside of some of the institutions yes. that have passed their judgment could use a little rigor yes. in that space, right? Um, there's great rigor, thought, um, understanding on how this work happens. So I, I, I know what we do is art. I know what we do is artful. I know that, um, that art and culture, um, and I, I, I bring culture inside of that space because I feel like that is also it's art. It's beautiful. Not in the way that we commodify it, but it is beautiful and serves the purpose of community building and engaging and of seeing yourself inside of something, of, of, of fostering a sense of belonging, right? Um, it, it, it is all us and is all made by people that look like us, right? And without that, I would not be able to be here what it is that I do and how it is that I do it right now. It's amazing that I'm in this beautiful air conditioned room after a lovely lunch, being flown here, having this conversation. If you know where I come from, it is a miracle. It is a miracle that I'm here. It is a miracle for me to be here. And that is only from dreams of my people, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, and people who never even knew me, but dreamed of my existence. It is only because of that and because of that sacrifice that I can sit here and even talk about something that's crazy, it's like crisis. <laughs> of course we're in crisis as a people, but what do we do and how does our work make our lives better? And how do you then learn lessons that are very apparent? They are in your face, and yet you still want to do what you did before, and you know that it didn't work then. Thank you. No. Thank you. And what I heard in that is art and theater and, and, and the expansiveness. You know, I, I actually wanted to read a couple quotes because I feel like there's all those people who say it better. But I wanted to just say, you know, of course, by the definite, there is that definition of theater, which is guys and dolls and and like costumes and box office and all that. But you know, I think everybody in this room knows theater is storytelling, theater is dance, theater is testimony, theater is literature, theater is poetry, theater is ceremony. Uh, theater is, um, it's assembly, right? And it's mutual aid. Um, and so for me, that's the definition of theater. It is this um, much more transcendent thing than just like the box it is put in and the Western canon, obviously. Um, and it is embodied solidarity in action. Um, but I wanted to read just a couple quotes and then uh, pass it on because I feel like they speak very much to these questions. 
And the first is Jimmy Baldwin, who wrote, every bombed village is my hometown, who wrote, the children are always ours, every single one of them, all over the globe. And I am beginning to suspect that whoever is incapable of recognizing this may be incapable of morality. To Grace Lee Boggs, who said, a revolution based on the people exercising their creativity in the midst of devastation is one of the great historical contributions of humankind. And Arundhati Roy, who is now being persecuted by an American ally, a fascist government in India, wrote, our strategy should be not only to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen, to shame it, to make, to mock it with our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentlessness, and our ability to tell our own stories. And, um, you know, so theater for me, in addition to all the things that I've mentioned and all of these brilliant um, folks said better than I could, is cultural resistance as well. Thank you. I have a couple things to say. Let's see how on track I can stay. Uh, the first thing is like kind of what in the white BS is this idea of like they get the term theater? Like, <laughs> Y'all have said it better than me, but it is older than the regional theater movement. Um, and on this like community theater tip, like let me tell you, this idea that they devalue us but use those words in their grant applications every day disgusts me, right? Let's just start there. Um, and I know we're not here to talk about aesthetics, but like, bruh. Bodies of culture have been pushing aesthetics and art forward since the beginning of time. I want to say we own that, yes. right? Um, and then lastly, like when I think about teatro, um, you know, y'all said it better than me. Theater's just so much bigger, and I just refuse to give them the term. I refuse to succumb to like the way Adrienne Marie Brown talks about it, the crisis of, imagine, of white imagination right now. Right? Um, so I so appreciate the question, but it brings up in me some big, like, wounds of how easily, when I was coming up in this field, I could be gaslit in those ways about the value of my work, the inherent aesthetics and history of Latinx theater that's even older than America, right? Like, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm not threading it all together for you, but um, let us not continue to be gaslit. And personally, I call my work solidarity. It uses solidarity economy frameworks. It's mutual aid, but it is also theater. Let us not let them take that away from us in its totality. It is, it is. Um, uh, whether the uh, word theater encompasses the breadth of our imagination, uh, I mean us, um, you know, Margot Kane, uh, she's an indigenous uh, friend and an elder and an artist in uh, Vancouver. Uh, she, we had invited her to do a piece, uh, and uh, she wanted to go to the grocery store, and she bought some different color lentils. And, and, uh, and at the end, uh, um, end of the piece, there was this whole ritual where she just made a big circle of different color lentils, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and in a large circle, and she just invited uh, uh, you know, the audience in uh, down intermediates, unfortunately, a beautiful space that does not exist anymore, as what we are talking about, that's crisis. You know, the, and, and so everybody, a um, lot of white <laughs> Minnesotans were very, you know, very reverential towards it. And no, is it, is it, and they asked Margot, uh, can we come inside the circle? Margot said, I invited you in. And I said, no, but is it sick? Uh, 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 I mean, we don't want to disrespect. With, uh, and so she asked, do you consider it sacred? Because it cost me only at a dollar eighty-five at the grocery store. And, and, and uh, you know, so 
the point of that was so profound for me. I was just listening at that time. I did not know. I just laughed uh, because people were so afraid um, to step into that in the circle. She said, it's a dollar eighty-five. It's not expensive. Just walk in, uh, and and then she asked, is it sacred to you? You know, uh, so to me, uh, the word theater is very, very, very expansive and it has elastic and it's sacred, you know. But I'm also very, very clear, like what um, Stephanie uh, said that, you know, uh, it only some, it's, it, anything is not cool if everybody is using it, right? Then it's not cool, right? If cool is only like when Stephanie in the morning she had a different hairstyle, then she lay her hair down. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's like cool. Yeah. Uh, so you know, so uh, they have use. Uh, I mean, the 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 centrality of conservatives have usurped our language. When uh, uh, brother Ismail uses the word power, you know, and. <laughs> And when theaters that have banned his work use the word power, it's two different contexts. So, and I'm so clear about it that, you know, it's, it's a war of narratives. Uh, it's a war of phrasing. That's why uh, uh, people who write, like we have writers sitting here, you know, uh, 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 you don't have the luxury of not writing in this moment. Poets, writers, thinkers, creatives, you know, we do not have the luxury of waiting for the muse. I mean, that might have, you know, uh, Shelley, Keats, Byron, Dixon, and all the British men, white men might have had the privilege of waiting for the muse. I mean, when uh, Alex says that uh, Alex's theater is in crisis, we are there. We have to be there to make shit happen if we talk about solidarity, you know. So to me, theater, because a police, a, a cop car and police has uniform, it has got sound, police car, it has got lights, it's got costume and man attitude. Right? They walk like this, you know, there's over five, they think that, you know, if you have three feet distance between your elbow and your pumped up chest, you know, then you have power. That's theater too. That's complete theater. Otherwise, why the hell do you have to have such a loud sound? Down, 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 get down, get down. I mean, I mean you're, we are talking to directors. We know how to use vo volume. You know, don't fucking teach us how to use volume. And we know wh what the reason for the volume is. So what I'm saying is that where is integrity housed? It's not there. You know, but that's theater too. You know, the, when, when Margot Kane puts that $1.85 uh, circle of lentil, you know, that's sacred. When Izumi, you know, uh, clean the space before we created, create any space, that's sacred. You know, when uh, Sharon Day begins us with a, a story and a song, that's sacred. You know, that sanctity is theater, integrity is theater. And... And the way we define it is our theater. You know, they can take the word, but they cannot take the history of, of folks of color. Our stories, our ritual, that's theater. You know, so to me, yes, any other word they will steal. <laughs> any word you can in birth, any word, they will steal it. Because that's what they know how to do. They'll co-opt it. They'll co-opt one of us. They'll give us $5 million, make us, and I wish they do. <laughs> right? No, we, and they will create disparity. They know how to divide us. Yes. Quintel Pro post 60s said that, and they're doing it at every step. They're dividing us. They, they know so well that solidarity is the key. If we truly, when the streets were full of, you know, intergenerational, interracial, all people, you know, now what is happening in school campuses, you know, they're afraid, you know, so, so any word they will use up, but they cannot use up our rituals, our stories, our elders, and what we feel about our work. So I feel that the word theater is like, you know, water that's been flowing, you know, uh, moments, uh, you know, academics give it a term. This is theater, absurd theater. Our whole fucking life is absurd. I mean, why, why only 60s are called absurd theater? Yeah. <laughs>
So uh, the, the word is not the point. The integrity is the question. Right. Thank you. Stephanie. You said yeah. something I think that's really important. I think, so the one thing that we said was, do we think with theaters? Yeah, I think what I do falls in that canon for sure. But I think the underlying thing is how are we different? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, yeah. Right? The underlying thing is how are we different? Yeah. And I think that the part that makes us different and makes us unique and gives us strength, especially during adverse times. So when we saw a whole lot of large institutions crumbling, they want to know why, how did y'all manage to stay? And part of it is how we can very quickly assemble yes. and become large um, networks yes. um, of care and capacity for our communities yes. and for ourselves. Yes. It's it, that understanding. We can quick, I like the Avengers, <laughs> right? I like the Avengers because part of it is like when they assemble, they all know, oh, let's get together. And there's not a whole lot of talking Right? There's not a whole lot of, because we know very quickly we have one mission, right? So we got one mission. We're getting out of this. We're getting out of this alive. We're getting out of this whole. We're getting out of this healthy. And I think it's our ability to very quickly assemble in that way, knowing what's on the line and moving things forward and learning from it, you know, and though it may not happen exactly the way that you did it in your community, but you learn from that. Um, and then we look at all of these other ways that we're able to activate things inside of our community um, against all the odds. Sometimes it's just putting our little meager resources together to make a thing that's bigger. We are just about at time. We are at the one hour mark. Uh, that went fast. Um, I'm so grateful for this conversation because as, as much as we are, are shifting the framing to be away from mainstream theater, people need to know that this work is happening and that this work has been happening and it didn't stop. When everybody else stopped, this work continued and you People like you and your communities and organizations like you have held us, held us in these times, in these moments of crisis. And I, I need to, we need to acknowledge that and we need to name that and affirm that. Um, knowing that we are very, very much at time, I do just want to give you all one last chance to um, speak anything that's lingering in your mind and then also just ask you, this work is hard and this work takes a lot. And we're learning about epigenetics and how trauma and PTSD and living in constant crisis is changing our very DNA expression, genetic expression. How do you sustain yourself? What's sustaining you in this work, in this moment, in this time? So you can choose to answer that or not or answer just something that's lingering before we really wrap up. I'm going to speak with what's on my heart right now. What's lingering is that we don't often think about that. This comes at a tremendous cost, a tremendous cost. Um, we saw people that we love and care about in our communities drop just like this because of a hardship, um, because of the anger, because of the frustration. And I didn't think about that, what it means to be on go like that. I was young. You throw your body at it because you don't know any better. Um, and then you pay a price for it. I found myself inside of that space and I had to be reminded by my staff, you can't do this forever in this way. I started feeling it. And the thing that pulled me out of it that allowed me to do what I needed to do for myself was one, that reflection from my staff. And then this past year, I realized why I was so frustrated. 
because all of my attention was going towards the executive part and not the artistic part. And when I tell you that art as a process, when I finally, because I felt so dry and thirsty, when I finally got to that space that I felt like there was something, finally I, I was, you know, oh my gosh, this is something that excites me artistically. <laughs> because I hadn't felt that excitement in such a long time. When I find, you know that first spark that you get? When you're like, oh my gosh, I have an idea. When it finally hit me, because I just, I thought there, there's not gonna be another good idea to come to me. It just won't happen. When it did, it happened just before Christmas. And I was like, this is great. And I went into, I was like, I'm starting this in January of just creating something, right? Saved my life, made me happy stopped a lot of almost beatdowns of people, <laughs> of board members, <laughs> of other people in community. Like, it stopped a lot. Just that. So honoring the artist in yourself, even though, like, some, a lot of us are hybrid, right? But honoring that artistic part is the part that saved me. And if ever there's a crisis, that's the crisis, right? Of, like, the imagination, I can always think myself out of it. I can always think, but I got to be open. I got to be working and I got to honor the sacred space of what it means to be an artist. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, every time my, my, my grief and my rage feel big, I, and they feel big, um, I, I remind myself how small it is compared to all of those other people, including people in this room. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm very much sustained by, by artists, brilliant artists and elders, especially in this room um, and the people on stage with me and artists that came before us um, and freedom fighters. And, and, you know, every time it feels, that rage feels big and that grief and sorrow feels big, I, um, you know, there are, there are folks breakdancing in the rubble in Gaza. There are folks clowning and writing poetry and making films um, and cooking and burying the dead uh, with, with, and helping children um, and taking care of folks. And, you know, they, they keep me going. Coming off of that um, train of thought that y'all are laying down, I think I'm learning to resist the myth of self-sacrifice as like a moral thing. And I think your workshop this morning so beautifully um, deepened my own understanding that the intellectualizing, the arguing, the wordsmithing, the word playing of justice is nothing compared to the somatic embodiment mm. of those values and practices. So I just want to like thank you for that lesson today. Yes. Came at the right time for me. Um, and then lastly, like I think we all have the power to divest of places and things that don't serve uh, our values. You know, I'll keep it brief, but I had to leave. A, um, mm, they call themselves a movement, an organization, um, in 2020 because there was. We were holding a lot of cash for future projects and not one cent went out to the people we say we're about. And I think use the labor and the energy you have and pull it and push it into the right places. So I do wanna just give a shout out um, to anybody watching this live stream, support the Andre Caillou Center in its effort to purchase its space as a site of remembrance. Think about where you're using your money and your activism, that's what I'm doing. And um, I will, I'll leave it there. Alexa, um, how do we sustain ourselves? Um, I think we can sustain if we resource the artists, one, and resource them well, 
not resource them so that we can continue this pathetic, uh, cruel terminology called, um, you know, uh, starving artists. I hate it. You know, I just detest it. Who, co who coined it? You know, and even if I felt the hunger, how the hell do you know to call me a starving artist? I mean, whatever. Uh, uh, so I think how do we sustain ourselves is just, just how do I sustain ourselves by like creating Pangea uh, spaces where and listening deeply to what just was just being said because artists are always telling you what artists need you know, and they're not waiting for the fruit to drop. You know, uh, they just plant orchards of fruit trees. Uh, 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 so, you know, uh, I, uh, how I sustain myself is standing in solidarity with Ismail, uh, with Stephanie, with Alex. Uh, and if I make, if I feel that I have the power and strength and imagination, uh, to make their dreams come true, then I'll be fine because they'll take care of me. Yeah. Yeah. In reciprocity, uh, there is sustenance. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Thank you all so much for your time and your wisdom and your experiences and your work. Um, I'm just really honored to be a part of this. Thank you to NIDEC and Pangea and art to action all of the amazing staff and folks working on tech. To, and thank you to HowlRound for having us live stream today. Uh, thank you all who joined us on the live stream. Um, we are going to say goodbye to our live stream friends and hope to see you out in the world.